Well, this morning, we're going to take a brief two-week break from our verse-by-verse exposition of the Gospel of Mark. I did debate that to some extent, since we are only 15 verses in, but I thought it would be appropriate in a very timely topic to cover over the next couple of weeks. And what I want us to specifically look at is a biblical understanding of gender and sexuality. Some nearly 20 years ago now, when I graduated college, I went into the profession of coaching After a four-year period, I had the incredible opportunity to work at a fairly prestigious private school in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I had the incredible opportunity, as it were, to work with a majority of kids, the number of them coming from Christian affluent families. These kids were given one of the best educations that money can buy, often getting many scholarships to prestigious universities around the nation. And they were given unique opportunities in the realm of athletics. Over the course of that four-year period, I had the opportunity to coach several incredible athletes. But one in particular stands out. In appearance, this young man was physically fit, he was chiseled, and he had rugged good looks. Athletically, he was extremely gifted with speed, with quickness, with strength, and an aggressive nature. He graduated high school and went on to a very prestigious Christian university, and he competed at a high level in both football and in track and field. If you would have asked me during that time to point to the young man who I thought might be the next CEO, the next great entrepreneur, the next great leader of man, or a great millionaire, it would have been him. Nearly three years ago now, though, I was directed to look at this young man's social media account, and on it, I was deeply saddened to find out what I discovered. On his social media account, he chronicled what he called his journey from being a man to now becoming what he said was a woman. Through a series of procedures and treatments and through what he stated was a process of prayer and counsel from trusted, godly individuals... He presented himself as a completely new person, a new gender, the one that God had truly made him to be. As shocking and as saddening as this was, what was more disheartening were the stream of comments coming in from those individuals who called themselves believers in support of his decision and an affirmation of what God had truly caused him to be. See, it doesn't take long, does it, to see the effects of sin and rebellion in our culture as it relates specifically to gender and sexuality. The utter destruction of the family as the unit of God's design blessing, cultural push to distort and twist one's God-ordained gender, to the mutilating of young children and young people's bodies attempting to transform themselves into something that God has not created them to be. Our culture, as it were, and our time overflow with perversion. But we would expect that, would we not? From Satan's world system? Take that which is God has designed to be true, to be right, and to be good, and pervert it? And then take that perversion and then dominate the entirety of sinful humanity through those philosophies, through that speak, through that propaganda, and through those ideologies. And in doing so, blinding their eyes to the truth and having them believe that to follow that sinful distortion, to follow that desire, will somehow bring them satisfaction. Isn't that always the lie? That which God has told us not to do, Satan tells us to pursue with the expectation that it will bring that satisfaction. We shouldn't be surprised then when the world perverts the good and righteous plan that God has set forth for gender and sexuality. 
Evolution itself claims that a man is an ongoing and progressively moving himself towards becoming the ultimate sexual being. And in order for him to achieve this, as part of that process, he must evolve into a sexual being where gender and sexuality is first fluid and then culminating where the differentiation in sexes is non-existent. He must become asexual. He must become androgynous. Being who, although he is created in the image of a holy God, his desires are to be remade in the image of Satan's world system. So the question is this morning, does it really matter? Does it really matter that the the church have such a clear and distinct view of gender and sexuality? I mean, shouldn't the church just be a place that accepts people, whatever their sexual desire is, and whatever their sexuality they claim to be, whatever just makes them happy? And then shouldn't we just support them in that endeavor, even if it means compromising what is clearly stated in the Word of God? And the simple answer to that is what? No, we cannot. Listen, it is love that desires to see someone who is bought into that lie come to a knowledge of the truth, turn from their sin, and then to be counted among God's people. What I want us to see this morning is that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and as part of His church, we believe that God, through His written Word alone, reveals and stipulates what His only true design for gender and sexuality is. Paul, when he is writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 15, said this. He says, I am writing these things to you, Timothy, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Paul tells Timothy, I'm writing to you so that what the church, that is that local of body believers in Ephesus, is to believe and that how they are to conduct themselves in light of that truth. And he makes then this incredible statement regarding the Scripture's relationship to the church. He says that the church acts as the pillar and the support of the truth. Paul here is really laying this foundation for this reality back in Ephesians 2.20 when he says this, speaking of the church, having been built on the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Paul says here in Ephesians 2, is that the Old Testament writings, the New Testament writings through the apostles, and the words of our Lord Jesus Christ Himself serve as the body of doctrine, the body of faith that the entire church is built upon. But not only are the Scripture the foundation by which the church is built upon, the church, the local expression of Christ's body, serves, <coughs> serves as the very foundation and support of that truth. Paul here is pulling again from the the imagery of Timothy's day in Ephesus, where he was the pastor. In Ephesus, you had that great temple of Diana, one of the seven wonders of the world, one of the defining features of this temple, were the 120-something pillars that were built upon the foundation of the temple that served to support this massive structure. And while those pillars' primary role was to support that structure, Each of those pillars was an individual tribute to a pagan goddess. Each one was handcrafted with marble, overlaid with gold, studded with precious stones, and served as a tribute to each of the kings who had privately funded that particular pillar of worship to that particular goddess. What Paul is telling Timothy is this. Just as that enormous structure served as a constant, visible testimony to the condemnation of sexual perversion and the judgment of false religion, so the church, the local expression of God's universal body, is to serve as a testimony to the truth of God's Word. In doing so, 
The church then is to unrelentingly hold to the truth. It is to testify to the truth. It is to contend for the truth. It is to treasure the truth. It is to proclaim the truth. And it is to protect the truth. And so amidst all the pressure of the culture, amidst all the lack of clarity from so-called godly men who are unclear and lead others astray even in our day, the church, Christ's true church, must speak with clarity on this issue of gender and sexuality. Over the next couple of weeks, I want us to begin to examine three aspects of a biblical understanding of gender and sexuality. This morning, I want us to look at the first of those two, God's perfect design for gender and sexuality and man's distortion of sexual gender and sexuality. And then Lord, next week, Lord willing, I want us to look at really the believer's relationship to gender and sexuality, as well as some of the issues within the so-called evangelical church as it relates to gender and sexuality. But first of all, this morning, we have to begin where it all begins, in creation. And I want us to begin to look at God's perfect design for gender and sexuality. Turn with me to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, chapter 1. <clears throat> and as we look at God's perfect design for gender and sexuality, there are several aspects of that that we need to examine this morning. The first of which comes in verse 27 of chapter 1 of Genesis. And that is that all man is created in the image of God. All mankind is created in the image of God. It says this in verse 27 of chapter 1. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. It is in this act of creation that in the eternal counsel of the Godhead of the Trinity, that God then continues to make man. It is referred to that man is both made and he is created. Man, though he is made as an animal in his basic physical structure, would be uniquely different from them because unlike the animals, man would also be created in the image of God. He would be distinct, and he would bear in his soul the reality of eternity, a moral conscience, the ability and to know and to express emotion, <clears throat> the ability to think and to analyze, to appreciate beauty, and most of all, the spiritual capacity to worship. Man was both made and created to reflect the reality and nature of his creator. And it's in this creation that God then lays out his design for gender and sexuality. And then secondly, as part of that, we need to understand that at creation, God himself in two separate acts created and defined gender by a physiological sex. At creation, God in two separate acts created and defined gender by a physiological sex. Look in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and we see that God formed man. It says, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground, and then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a what? Living being. Before where God spoke creation into existence, here he is intricately involved in the creation of man. From the dust of the earth, just as a potter sets the clay upon the wheel to create a great piece of art, so God formed the material parts of man from the clay. Man at that moment was then breathed into the breath of life by God himself. In an instant, Man contained all the material part of him that would make him a male. And in doing so, God, in one word, establishes the male sex and defines Adam as a what? Man. Secondly, God fashioned woman. Genesis 2, 22 through 23. The Lord God fashioned to a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, so she shall be called what? Woman, because she was taken out of man. 
The word for fashion here means to build. Where Adam was formed from a lump of clay and then breathed into the to life by the creative sovereign power of God, here Eve is built from Adam's rib into a woman. God himself built her then for the man and he gave her the name that corresponds to her physiological sex that he gave her, calling her a what? A woman. Genesis goes on to affirm that both Adam and Eve were created and defined by their physiological sex because in the next breath of the creation account, what does God command them to do? Genesis 1.28 be fruitful and what? Multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Listen, God gave man a seed. That seed must be put into a woman. The woman must be able to physiologically receive that seed. This is how God designed it, and it is the only way that it works. God did not create two males, nor did he create two females. He created and he defined of his own free and sovereign decree the physiological sex that he assigned uniquely to a man and uniquely to a woman for the intent of what? Procreation. He assigned it. Listen, in no way does man have the holy privilege and sovereign ability as God himself to determine what a male and a female are. He or she does not have the right to identify with or assign themselves a gender of their own choosing. In creation, God alone, as the sovereign creator who is in the power of his own being, created all things, and who formed and fashioned Adam and Eve, gave them their physiological sex as he determined, and in doing so, he assigned them their God-decreed gender. But this identification just wasn't true of creation. It continued on from that point throughout the rest of Scripture. Thirdly, this morning, I also want us to see that after his creation, God determined the gender of all humans by their physiological sex at the time of their birth. Genesis 18, chapter 10. He says this, and he said, I will surely return. This is the Lord speaking to Abraham. I will surely return to you at this time next year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a what? A son. And Sarah was listening to the front door, which was behind them. So in chapter, in verse 10 of chapter 18, it states that the Lord himself was the one who appeared to Abraham, meaning the individual speaking here is a none other than the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ himself. And in his promise of her coming pregnancy, he refers to the child as a what? A son. Defined by and differentiated by his what? Physiological sex. In Leviticus, in Leviticus chapter 12, the scripture again properly defines gender by physiological sex, both male and female. Gen Leviticus chapter 12 verse 2. Speak to the sons of Israel saying, when a woman gives birth and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean for seven days, as in the day of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. So the Lord says, look, if she is going to bear a male child, then he goes on to say this in verse 5. But if she doesn't bear a mere child, but she bears a what? A female child. Then she shall be unclean for two weeks as in her menstruation, and she shall remain in the blood of her purification for 66 days. And then verse 7. Then he shall offer it before the Lord and make atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the flow of blood. Why? This is the law of her who bears a child, whether a female or what? Or a male. So we see even after creation, God is clear. <clears throat> the physiological sex that he himself assigns is what differentiates between a male and a female. Now listen, there would be plenty of proponents of homosexuality that say that Jesus never spoke out against homosexuality or gender, therefore it must be okay. Well, that might hold up, except we don't see that over and over in the Gospels. Fourthly, I want us to see that Jesus' own teaching and affirmation on gender and sexuality. Listen to Matthew chapter 19, verse 4. 
He says, and he answered and said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them what? Male and what? Female. Mark chapter 10, verse 6. But from the beginning of creation, God made them what? Male and what? Female. Now let's put on our theological thinking caps here for a little bit. Who created all things? God. What persons of the Trinity were involved in that process? All of them, right? God the Father was the one who designed and oversaw the process. Colossians tells us that Jesus was the one who superintended the creation. And we learn from Genesis 1 that the Spirit was the one who was energizing that process. Jesus said this of himself in John chapter 5, verse 17. He said, but he answered them and said, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. Colossians 1.16, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him, and what? For him. Jesus, in these words, was affirming that he himself was the one who created And in creation, he created two genders differentiated by two distinct physiological sexes, male and female. And they were created in the creation design to complement one another and who in the context of marriage are to enjoy the sexual union that God has given for the purpose of what? Procreation. This is God's design. What's the implication then? What are the resulting truths then of God's design for gender and sexuality? Let me give you three of them. First of all, all attempts to redefine human sexuality beyond the physiological male-female distinction. Now, whether that's science telling that they need to be redefined or that's just the culture, any kind of redefinition of human sexuality beyond the physiological male-female distinction are a sinful rebellion against a creator. Secondly, not only are the distinctions and redefining of the distinctions rebellion, all attempts to change one's birth gender are a sinful rebellion against our creator. Listen, you have no right before your creator to decide that although you are a man, you decide one day that you will become a woman. Thirdly, as our creator, God stipulates in his word that the only legitimate and acceptable sexual desires and sexual acts are those between a man and a woman in the context of what? Marriage. Listen, there are a number of myriads of shades, as it were, of sexual perversion. Some of that can be sexual immorality, lusting, as well as homosexuality. And what we need to understand is, is that God has given us a righteous standard. He has given His Word that stipulates and is the only legitimate, acceptable, acceptable understanding of what true sexuality is to be carried out between a man and a woman in the context of marriage. So we see very clearly God's design in gender and sexuality. Next, I want us to see man's sinful distortion of gender and sexuality. Man's sinful distortion of of gender and sexuality. After the creation of God's design for gender and sexuality, God calls His creation what? Very good. No sin, no disease, no strife, and most of all, no what? Death. And it's in this state of perfection that in Genesis 3, Satan then appears to Adam and Eve in the garden. Satan, as we learned over the last few weeks, as we looked at the temptation of Christ, was a majestic, angelic being of the highest order created by God who had the privilege to serve before the throne of God Himself. And yet, as Isaiah says, though he was blameless, his heart was lifted up, desiring to be God. Therefore, he was then corrupted, and then sin came into being out of the heart of Satan. And now, instead of being that majestic being who once served at the feet of God, he is now God's greatest adversary. His desire is to deceive and to lead astray those who God has created. And in Genesis chapter 3, we see the opportunity he has to do so. 
He appears to Eve in the garden as she is alone, away from the protection of Adam, and he entices her through a series of statements and questions meant to lead Eve into questioning God's goodness and his authority. And in falling into temptation, believing the lies of Satan, Eve falls, Adam falls, and tragically through this fall is brought into sin as well as death into the world. A relationship that was once perfect and like nothing now is separated by sin. The goodness of God once enjoyed in all of its fullness was gone and the desire and the design for male and female was distorted. As part of the fall, sexual perversion, sexual immorality enters then into the human heart and into the world. It wasn't true of just Adam and Eve, as it were, but Romans states the sin that was imputed to Adam, that Adam committed, has been passed then to every person born of him. Romans 5.12, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because what? All sinned. It's out of this fall as we then begin to work through, then chronologically through the book of Genesis, that we see the digression of sin and how it begins to express itself. Genesis chapter 4, we see the first murder and the killing of Abel by Cain. By the time that we get to Genesis chapter 6, we see the effects of sin running rampant. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 verse 1. It says, Now it came about when the men began to multiply on the face of the land, And daughters were born to them. But the Son of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves. Whomever they chose, what's going on here? Rampant infidelity. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. Verse 4. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterwards, when the sons of men came to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. What's going on here? We have these demonic beings possessing men, having intercourse with women, and producing children. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. That is to say that these were women who were involved in demonic worship to the extent that they were having relations with men who were possessed by demons. So what is the Lord's assessment of the state of mankind at this point? Listen to verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only continually evil. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So in response to man's wickedness, the Lord then what? He sends a flood, he wipes out an entire generation except for Noah and his family, and that should solve the problem, right? No. Once off the ark, we see once again that the intent of man's heart was always and will always be continually evil. In Genesis chapter 11, we see a man arise by the name of Nimrod, who is the builder of a great number of powerful ancient cities and civilizations, including Babel. These cities and civilizations carry with them the pagan idolatry of Nimrod, Egypt, Babylon, Assyria were representative nations that characterized and who were characterized by grotesque, brutal ceremonies of human sacrifices, temple prostitution, body mutilization, sexual perversely acts, and homosexuality. And as we continue to move through the historical timeline of the book of Genesis, we find ourselves coming to Genesis chapter 19. And in Genesis chapter 19, we are introduced to twin cities. They are representative of the idolatrous civilizations that existed. And they are Sodom and Gomorrah. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 19. And as you're turning there, what we're going to see in Genesis Genesis chapter 19 is the distortion of God's good design for gender and sexuality that's tragically on display. To set some context, look in verse 4 through 7 of chapter 19. 
leading up to this lot, after taking in these angelic travelers into his home, is then rushed by these men of the town who are desiring to have homosexual relations with these angels who have come in the form of men. It says this in verse 4, Before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. Disgusting. But Lot went out to them at the doorway and shut the door behind him and said, Please, my brothers, do not act, what? Wickedly. Now notice here, in verses 4-7, through seven, the makeup of this mob. It states that the men of the city came. And not just a few, all of them. If it had only been a very small group of them, then the Lord would have spared Sodom due to Abraham's plea. Remember this? Lord, if there's just what? If there are just ten men in that city, spare the city. And yet that's not the case. And so what we need to understand is that all of Sodom was completely given over to these sinful homosexual cravings. I want you to notice also, look at the age ranges involved in these. These are males of all ages. It says young and old. The word for young in the Hebrew provides an understanding of the age of these men who are young. The word for young is used to describe a male who is anywhere between infancy and adolescence. It is predominantly used in the Old Testament to describe a young boy, a lad as we might call them, and is used primarily to describe a young boy who serves as a servant or a slave to an older man. So what we see in the depravity of Sodom is a pagan, idolatrous culture that is given over to insatiable homosexual lusts and desires at every single age. The young boys and the men of the city were obviously trained by it. They had been indoctrinated by it, by the older men of the city passing it down to the young ones of the city. And then it has found its full expression in the older men of the city. What what we need to understand from this account is no one in Sodom is exempt from this. So what happens as a result? What does God do? Wipes it out. Now listen, there will be those who will look at Sodom and Gomorrah, who are proponents of homosexuality, who will look at what God did to Sodom, and they will say that the reason that God destroyed Sodom was that their lack of hospitality. I think we can all say it's probably a stretch. But you know what? We don't have to make our argument on our own. The Scriptures tell us that was the case. Jude The half-brother of our Lord, writing his epistle in verse 7, says this, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way, what's that same way? Then that of the fallen angels who were cast out of heaven into judgment. As they did what? What was the reason for their judgment? As these indulged in gross immorality and went after what? Strange flesh are exhibited as an example in the undergoing punishment of eternal fire. Look, this is the hall of fame that you don't want to make. Sodom and Gomorrah were not judged for their lack of hospitality, but rather for their desire with sexual relations with men, notated here by the words strange or different flesh. That is to say that they went after or perverted God's design for sexuality and gender, going after what was un natural to them. Fast forward to the book of Judges. The theme of the book of Judges is that every man did what was right in his own eyes. That is to say, if you want to see a society where God has been rejected, where man has turned to idolatry, where man is given over to sin, then read the book of Judges. Genesis 19, tell me if this sounds familiar. 19 verses 22 through 23. While they were celebrating, behold, the men of the city, and then they are defined as certain worthless fellows, surrounded the house, 
pounding the door, and they spoke to the owner of the house, the old man, saying, Bring out the man who came into your house, that we may have what? Relations with him. Then the man, the owner of the house, went out and said to them, No, my fellows, please do not act so wickedly, since this man has come into my house. Do not commit this act of what? Folly. What's the response of the man? He throws his virgin daughter out. This is what the Lord continually and over and over warned the nation of Israel against in the Old Testament. Listen to Leviticus 18 verse 22. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Leviticus chapter 20 verse 13. If there is a man who lies with a male as those who lie with a woman... Both of them have committed a detestable act. They should surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is what? Upon them. Listen, the act of homosexuality was something that God took very serious. But it's not only the act of intercourse. It's any move or desire in attempting to satisfy that lust. Listen to Deuteronomy 22.5. A woman shall not wear man's clothing, nor shall a man put on a woman's clothing. Why? For because whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. The Lord here is warning against what? Transvestite. Someone who purposely dresses in the opposite sex's clothing to fulfill some unnatural sexual desire. Men dressing in female robes was a common idolatrous practice and the false worship of Venus and the Astaroth. And women in that culture would then often dress in man's armor to worship the god Mars, the god of war. The person who does so, as the Lord says, is what? An abomination. They're an abomination because the thing in which they do reflects the true intention and motivation of their heart. There is also the warning for someone who would attempt to change their gender. Listen to what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 1. No one who is emasculated or has his male organ cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. So what's going on here? In ancient times, within pagan cultures, people would often emasculate themselves in order to become a eunuch in the worship of pagan deities or to make themselves a pagan prostitute. Children were especially vulnerable to these practices. Archaeologists have found ancient writings noting that this was done many times by parents to children as young as 10 years old as part of a ritual to gain some kind of favor from these demonic false gods. In fact, in 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 12, we see Asa stand up against this. He says this, He also put away the male cult prostitutes from the land and removed all the idols which his father had made. You see, what you must understand about a pagan idolatrous culture, one that is given over, as Paul says, to the doctrine of demons, is that it is always characterized by two main sins. Brutality and sexual perversion. Brutality in the sense that any semblance of the image of God that man is created in has been done away with, and so there is no restriction to harm someone. That is completely absent from the conscience. And sexual perversion, that is, in his idolatry, man then turns away from God's own design to strange flesh, to unnatural sexual relations. In fact, if we examine most of the major empires including our own. We see there are a number of false gods, from Molech to Baal to Ashtoreth and many more. These demonically created false religions carry out these grotesque practices of human sacrifice, torture, body mutilation, pedophilia, sodomy, bestiality, and so on as part of their religious rituals to gain favor from these pagan gods. Listen, don't think what you see today in young people going to these medical facilities in an attempt to change their their God-decreed sex is anything new. 
It has been going on since the time of the ancient world and as the means of and motivation towards idol worship. It's just that today the methods may have become a little bit more advanced and sophisticated. Also, don't think that there aren't those today who do exactly as the parents did in ancient history, who give their child up to be mutilated, to change their gender, in pursuit of finding favor with some demonic false god. Don't think that doesn't go on. The Lord says those who do so, they are to be cut off from the true worship of the true God. Also, homosexual practices were a sign of God's judgment of handing over the people of Israel to their enemies. Listen to Isaiah chapter 3, verse 1. For behold, the, the Lord of hosts is going to remove from Jerusalem and, Ju- and Judah both supply and support, the whole supply of bread and the whole supply of water, the mighty men and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50 and the honorable man the counselor and the expert artisan and the skillful enchanter. And I will make mere lads their princes and capricious children will rule over them. And the people will be oppressed, each one by another and each one by his neighbor. The youth will storm against the elder and the inferior against the honorable when a man lays hold of his brother in his father's house saying, you have a cloak, you shall be our ruler and these ruins will be under your charge. He will protest on that day and say, I will not be your healer, for in my house there is neither bread nor cloak. You should not appoint me to be ruler of these people. For Jerusalem has stumbled and Judah has fallen because their speech and their actions are against the Lord to rebel against his glorious presence. What's going on there? Israel rebels and the Lord is taking away what? all the good things, all the provision, all of the restraints as it were on a society to keep a civilization and society going. God says, I'm going to judge Jerusalem. I'm going to take away all the the provisions of substance, the good things which he has given, he is going to take away. The benefits of a society, the skilled workers, a legitimate government functioning as it should, God's gracious provision of wise and prudent rulers, they're going to be done away with. Because of the rebellion against the Lord. And along with that, there's going to be open shame of sin. Listen to what he says in verse 9. The expression of their faces bears witness against them. And they display their sin like who? Sodom. They do not conceal it. Woe to them. Listen. What Isaiah is saying is very clear. The people in the rebellion have no remorse for their sin. They flaunt their perversion just as Sodom did. They openly practice the sins of Sodom without restraint or fear of God. God then says in his judgment, I am going to hand them over to it. Listen, the normalization of homosexuality is never a move to a more sophisticated society. It is never a move to a freer world, a better or a more evolved humanity. It is always a deeper plunge away from God's design into the judgment of chaos, darkness, slavery, and death. While the Old Testament provides clarity regarding man's distortion of God's design, the New Testament does amply as well. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8-11, through 11, he says this, But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and for the sinner, for the unholy and for the profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers or murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of our blessed God, which with I have been then entrusted Paul says this, Timothy, look, the law is good. Why? Because it brings conviction of sin to the unbeliever. And who is listed in that list? The homosexual. This is one of New Testament passage among many. But there is a paramount passage. One that we would be remiss if we did not go to, and that's Romans chapter 1. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. And what I want us to see in this passage is 
is the digression of sin, the digression of idolatry. And the first aspect of that digression is this. Man has a knowledge of God, yet he suppresses that knowledge in unrighteousness. Man has a knowledge of God, yet he suppresses it in unrighteousness. Look in verse 18 of chapter 1. Paul says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power, His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through that which has been made so that they are without excuse. Listen, what Paul is saying here in this verse is, there is no such thing as an atheist. Paul says that every person who was born and lives, they live with the knowledge of the true God. In theological terms, we would say that man has a presuppositional understanding as to the existence of God. Paul says that God's attributes have been clearly seen. They have been made evident by God Himself in creation and in the human heart. Paul tells us in Romans 2 that the knowledge of the law has been written on the human heart in the form of the conscience. Both of which in creation and the conscience are constantly testifying to the existence of God. Therefore, Paul says, man is without excuse. True issue is that man in his sin then what? Suppresses the knowledge, as Paul says. It's like a beach ball in water that he continually tries to push down to submerge under water, only to find it continually breaching the surface and testifying to the knowledge of God. But instead, with that knowledge, instead of coming to God, how he has revealed himself, secondly, Paul tells us, they refuse to worship God for how he has revealed himself. Look at verse 21. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and of crawling creatures. So what does man do? He suppresses the knowledge of God in unrighteousness. He refuses then to worship God for how He has revealed Himself. And then thirdly, as a result... God gives him over to sexual immorality. Verse 24, Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their heart to what? Impurity. So that their bodies would be dishonored among them. This is the heterosexual immorality part. This is the sexual sin running rampant in the human heart, in the human body, apart from the confines of marriage. But it doesn't stop there. It says this, Next, in exchange for the worship of the true God, by suppressing it, and by hand it over, then man then creates an idol to worship. Paul says this, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. So what does God do? As a result of that, God then hands them over beyond the heterosexual sin to the homosexual sin, to the unnatural desires. Verse 26, for this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire for one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own person the due penalty for their error. Verse 28, that's got to be enough to make them recognize God, right? Verse 28, they reject any notion of God and His rule. Verse 28, and just as they did not see fit, fit to acknowledge God any longer. As a result, God then gives them over to a, what it says, a reprobate mind and a hardened, godless life. He says this, God gave them over to a depraved mind 
to do the things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they knew the ordinance of God that those who practice things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but get hearty approval to those who do what? Practice them. Listen, this is the mind who has no restrictions. No constraints given to the full expression of this sinfulness and participation in. No pause for conscience. Everything is done in an abhorrence to God. This is the mind who judges what is right in his own eyes. And yet, even though they still, as it says, remain and retain some rudimentary understanding of the coming wrath of God, what do they do? They plunge headlong into it and then they pat the backs and champion those who do the same. Listen, while the culture tries to glamorize the distortion of God's design for gender and sexuality, you must understand it is an expression of a heart that has rejected God and has fallen. It has fallen further and further into the full expression of their own depravity. To use an example as if they stand at the heights of a staircase looking down into a dark dungeon of judgment. And with every step downward, they are suppressing the truth. And then their suppressing of the truth, they take one more step down that dark staircase. First into the lust of the flesh. And then further suppressing the truth, they take another step down, still being handed over then to the unnatural lust, insatiably burning for those of the same sex. And with every step of their suppression of the knowledge of God, they resemble less and less the image of God that they were created in and resemble more and more the demonic idolatry they worship. And before long, they have taken so many steps downward, they are now what? Bound by it. They are cut off. Listen, you can't get any clearer of a picture than that. <clears throat> so the question this morning is, is there any hope for this person? Is there any hope for the person who is a homosexual? Is there any hope for the person who has disobeyed God's design for gender, trying to attempt to move themselves from being a man or a woman or a woman into a man? Listen to Paul, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, that's the female or the the weak side of the homosexual relationship, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says this in verse 11, such what were some of you? But you were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and in the spirit of our God. We'll look at this passage next week more in detail. But Paul says that there were those that he was writing to in the church in Corinth who were what? They had been homosexuals, amongst other things. And Paul says, you know what? You're not that anymore. You've been redeemed. You see, the gospel doesn't affirm homosexuality, regardless of what you might hear from the church. It is not something that you merely believe in, in fact, while still being able to live as a homosexual. The gospel is, as Paul says in Romans 1, the power of God that so works upon the soul to see the sinfulness of homosexuality. To wrought new life by the Spirit of God through that message and bring about a desire to turn from that sin, to turn in obedience to Jesus Christ and His design for gender and sexuality. Listen, any other message that doesn't do that is not the true gospel. Listen, you may be here this morning, you may fall into one of two camps. 
You may be the person who recognizes in the culture that homosexuality is wrong. It's leading our culture down a bad way. Our country is going to pot. And yet, instead of a biblical and godly example and attitude, you become angered. You're willing to do whatever it takes to save this country, and you are blinded to the reality of man's greatest need. Listen, in the garden, amidst man's sinful rebellion, the Lord provided hope of what? A promised seed. At the time of Noah, the Lord was gracious and long-suffering in sending Noah to preach some 100 years ahead of the flood, calling people to repentance before the fury of his wrath was expressed in the flood. Abraham, as we just saw, pleaded with the Lord that there be any righteous in Sodom that he might spare the city. And even now, he testifies through creation and the conscience, calling the unbeliever to recognize his divine power and presence that he might turn to him in the way that he has prescribed. Second aspect of this I've heard people say might sound something like this. Well, God just told me that I just need to love that person. In fact, they would go so far as to say something like this. I don't even have to say anything. I just need to love them. Listen, God didn't tell you that. You need to stop listening to yourself and start preaching to yourself. Surely compassion for those who are in sinful chains of homosexuality to the chains of sin does in our redeemed souls expresses itself in a desire and a compassion and mercy for these people to come out of it. Think about our Lord Coming into the triumphal entry, he wept for those who rejected him. But as it was with our Lord, our compassion should be birthed out of the reality of their coming judgment. People have convinced themselves that somehow speaking the truth to those in walk in darkness is unloving. Listen, love is never void of truth. But you know what? That's what the world's taught you. That's what the world wants you to believe. You've been taught by the world that you need to accept and embrace someone's sexuality. That you cannot tell someone by any authority what gender they are or who they can love or what they desire. They demand that you accept them as they are and if you don't, then you are being what? Unloving. Listen, nothing could be further from the truth. If you truly love them, if you truly understand the spiritual reality of their sin, how can you not share the truth of the gospel? Listen, in doing so, you may be hated. You may be scorned. You may be ridiculed. But we pray, as Paul prayed, and as the God did in Corinth, by the power of His Spirit, under the full conviction of their sin, that some would turn and would bow the knee to Jesus Christ and embrace His design for gender and sexuality. That is real love. Let's pray. Our Father, we come this morning with heavy hearts heavy hearts to see a society and a culture that has been given over to depravity, given over to idolatry, and then therefore, Father, given over to sexual perversion, of which homosexuality is part of that catalog. We see its effects both in our culture, we see its effects in the family, we see its effects in young people's lives. We see the confusion that it brings, we see the hate that it brings, we see the disgust that it brings. And yet, Father, while we might be the ones who are the objects of that hate, we fully understand that who they are truly hating is you. We did not give them the design. You gave them the perfect design. And you testify within the heart as to the creative order and to that design in their hearts. And yet, as Paul says, they continually suppress it in unrighteousness. So, Father, the sinful man lives in a chain of unbroken sin in which he suppresses, is given over, suppresses even more, is given over even more. Father, we do pray that you would give us the opportunity 
to so share the gospel, to be proactive, to, to love them to the, to the extent that we want to see them avoid the judgment that is theirs, to be freed, as it were, from the bondage of, of sexual sin, of homosexuality that not only dominates them, but also kills them and brings death into their life. We pray that you would be and do your work as you did in Corinth in bringing spiritual life to those who walk in darkness. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.